most of you probably are much further along your graph journey we are just starting up so uh, the purpose of this exercise was uh, since we are just starting up we are evaluating different graph technologies uh, that be graph processing libraries or even graph storage uh, during that journey uh, since I come from Denny's team and he is really big into Spark, we thought we'll start with graphics. So this is just a, a very simple uh, introduction into graphics uh, where we uh, did a prototype on a small data set we generated. Uh, what you see here is actually the Databricks cloud. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of Databricks cloud. It's essentially a managed uh, Spark service which you can deploy in your AWS instance and Databricks essentially manages it for you. You don't have to worry about the infrastructure, you can just use it. Uh, this particular um, uh, this particular cluster, I think it's a, it has 54 gigs of uh, memory. I think it has two nodes. Uh, so this is basically what they have given you with the Databricks Cloud is uh, similar to IPython, but this is essentially for Spark. So you can uh, code, uh, you can write code in Spark in Scala, in Python, also you can write Spark SQL. So that's good. Uh, for most of you who are very comfortable with REPL, uh, others who are not so much, this is a good thing because especially when you are ramping up onto a new technology like Spark. REPL is not necessarily very user friendly uh, for newcomers. So since my team is uh, ramping up on Spark and trying out all these things, this was a really great way for us to start because uh, it's just much more user friendly when you code and keep track of what you're doing. So uh, the data set I have is essentially a restaurant data set where some users visit some restaurants and then I have that information about them. This is a dummy data set I created. So Dynet is the table which I have created here and if I do select star from it, it essentially shows the schema and some sample data. So I have a user who visited this restaurant on this date. That is essentially the data on a row wise basis. Now, the good thing is that uh, the Databricks Cloud, this, uh, the notebook, it also supports visualization using D3. So I have a small visualization here, which if I run, essentially will show you uh, what I'm talking about here. So this is just a subset of the actual data where essentially it shows the relationship we are talking about here, which is users visiting uh, restaurants. Now given this data is right now in a tabular format, row-wise, and I essentially want to load it into a graph. Uh, in the subsequent steps, I'm just going to show you how you can do that. Uh, one of the challenges personally from me when I looked at this DAP is, was that most of the examples, when you're learning up on Spark and graphics, most of the examples have homogeneous graphs where the nodes is of just one type. In real life scenario, often you will have graphs with we will have heterogeneous graphs with more than one node type. So in this case, you have two node types, a user and a restaurant. So how do you model that in graphics? So uh, before I can put it all that into a graph, what I need to do is just do some data cleansing. So in this steps, I essentially uh, figure out who my users are from the data and find a distinct set of users. That's what I'm doing here. So once I do that, uh, I go on to actually define a class hierarchy which will define my data model. So um, I have a user class and I have a restaurant class. The user has just one attribute, uh, two attributes rather, the user ID and the degree. What the degree is and why it is part of the user class will become obvious later. Uh, the restaurant class has the restaurant name. The place ID is essentially a unique identifier which is coming from Google Places. We use Google Places to find this restaurant, so that's the place ID is the Google Place identifier for that. And then we have other attributes like street address, city, postal code, so on and so forth. We also have the degree as one of the attributes of the restaurant class. 
The interesting thing to note is that we have a parent uh, class called vertex property, and then the user and restaurant classes inherit from vertex property. Your vertex property is just ID and the degree. Why we need to do, do this is because uh, essentially even though my graph is a heterogeneous graph, from a data structure perspective, I need to, while initializing it, I can only give it one node type. So to represent that in a data model, we have the parent vertex property and then we have two childs for that. Um, so in this step, uh, using, uh, using the tabular data I had, which is in distinct valid rows, I actually for each row um, in that data set, I instantiate a user uh, using the constructor. So what that gives me is the RDD, RDD user. I do something similar for restaurants also, so that ultimately I can have a RDD restaurant, which is what I get here. For each of the restaurants in my tabular data, I instantiate the, uh, the restaurant uh, object, and then I have the RDD for that. Uh, but now the problem was that, well, I have two RDDs, the user RDD and the restaurant RDD. But to instantiate the graph, I just want one data structure. So uh, Spark has the union uh, function, which it provides. So using the union property, uh, union method, we essentially smoosh those two RDDs together to get one single RDD called vertices, which is of type RDD vertex property. Now this is possible essentially because of the data model I chose in the previous step, where vertex property is a parent class, so it can inherently uh, store references to child classes. So sc.union uh, essentially on um, users and restaurants gives me that. At this point, I have my vertices RDD, but uh, the data structure which the graph constructor expects is actually the, the vertex ID, comma, uh, tuple of vertex ID and vertex property. So. The vertices RDD I created in the previous step is essentially remapped to uh, create a RDD of tuples, where each tuple is a pair of vertex ID and the vertex property node. Now having created my vertices, now I need my edges. Uh, if you see the data, the tabular data here, edge is essentially the user visited this place ID on this date. So essentially the first three columns represent the edge relationship in my graph. So I extract that information uh, from the tabular data, and then I instantiate my uh, RDD edge string, uh, which essentially is creating an edge uh, using the map function here. Uh, an edge here is essentially the source, which is the first uh, column, and the destination, which is the third column, and the date, which is basically the attribute of that edge, which is the third uh, argument in this uh, method. So having now, uh, having the vertices and the edges available to me, now I instantiate my graph. Uh, the graph has to be defined. What type of graph do we have? So we have a graph which has a node type of vertex property and has an edge type of string, where the string is essentially the date. So we instantiate that using graph, vertex RDD, edges. And then the third argument is just a dummy node I pass to the constructor so that if I have um, some edges in my data which do not have any nodes, then it can uh, replace that with the dummy node. Having done that, now we can explore some of the basic APIs uh, which, uh, which come with the graph object. One of the first uh, ones is the edge triplet view. So this is an RDD containing the edge triplets, and when I say edge triplet, it is essentially, well, node one has a relationship with node two. So if you want to view that, you can just access the graph.triplets um, attribute in the graph object. And then uh, I have just printed that here uh, by applying a map function on all the triplets. So essentially, user ID, this visited uh, the Western Dallas on this date, uh, 18th 
8th January 2014. So that's one way of having seeing the edge triplet view. Other attributes which come with the graph object are the in degree, out degree, number of edges, number of vertices, so on and so forth. Why this is this how this is going to help us will get more obvious in the following examples. Now the next few queries are essentially uh, we are going to generate some aggregates. Now, since we have all our data in a graph and graph is not necessarily the right structure for doing aggregates, but coming from a relational background, probably from analytics background, the first thing you would want to see from your data are some simple aggregates. So that's what we went ahead and do. We want to see what are the top 10 most visited restaurants and the top 10 most active users in this data set. Now, there are more than one ways of doing that, and this is probably in order of optimization I have done, I have shown it here. The so first method is the naive way. Essentially, I have my degrees, so I sort my degrees to find the nodes with the, high, with the highest degree. So I sort the in degrees I calculated in the previous step, uh, the attribute in the previous step, and I sort that in a descending order, and I take just the top 10. So that, now remember this graph has user to restaurant relationship. So it's a directed graph where users only have outgoing edges and restaurants only have incoming edges. So essentially when you uh, sort this, in this case, in degrees means it has to be restaurants and out degree means it has to be a user. So that's why I'm doing a sort on in degrees to find the top 10 restaurants. And then I go ahead and print that. The second method, uh, uh, the second method was uh, essentially to use one of the methods which come with the graph object, which is the outer join vertices. In this case, what you're doing, remember I had uh, initialized the degree attribute in my data model. So essentially, those degree attributes were set to zero at the time of initialization. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to join the graph with its in degrees and then update that uh, degree attribute so that you get a new graph where each node has its uh, degree updated in it. <coughs> so in this case, this is what the graph dot outer join uh, vertices does there. And as you see, I am doing a, a join with the in degrees. And then later on, I'm doing another outer join with the out degrees. Uh, essentially, this first join uh, updates the degree of the restaurants, and then the second join updates the degree of the user. So then I print that, so I have now user 9726763 has visited 33 unique restaurants. Similarly, uh, Starbucks has the most number of visitors. So the third method is, uh, again, this is probably the easiest, requires the least amount of code. It uses page rank. Now, since page rank is all about uh, the links between nodes and uh, the nodes which have the maximum number of references from other places get scored higher. So automatically, when I uh, apply the page rank algorithm here, I get the same results essentially where uh, restaurants have with the most number of incoming links get the highest score. And that's what that's I, that's what I wanted. So I uh, in this case you just do graph dot page rank and then that gives you a new graph, and on that graph you just uh, take the top ten vertices ordered by the page rank score. So that's that's the simple presentation, a short presentation I had. Uh, we are going to do more, take more on this uh, essentially to do some more advanced. Uh, analytics like uh, collaborative filtering on this to figure get some recommendations and all that. Uh, those are probably the next steps. There are interesting um, label propagation in stuff and link prediction information uh, stuff here, which we would like to try as well. So those are what's going to come in the near future. Uh, this presentation was more about giving you intro to graphics, also. Uh, the ease of use of this uh, notebook format in, in the Databricks Cloud has been really helpful for our team to ramp up. If you don't have Databricks Cloud, uh, which at some point Databricks Cloud kind of uh, flaked out on me and then I had to find other alternatives. So there's an open source project called Zeppelin. Um, some of you might be using that. So I actually ported all my code to Zeppelin 
uh, and this works exactly the same as the Databricks Clorant. It, it's really useful also. The same IPython notebook format where you can write your code and test it in a browser um, has very good interaction. Uh, we actually today, uh, we actually finished deploying, uh, Zeppelin doesn't come with Cloudera, but today we actually did a custom build for Zeppelin for our uh, cluster and we actually deployed it on our cluster. So now users uh, are actually using Zeppelin on, on our clusters from today. So, so that's good. I think it's still an Apache incubation project, still work in progress, but it, I, I, I feel my experience so far has been pretty good with it. So that's it for me. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes. I noticed a lot of typecasting in your Scala Yeah, because I am a still a learning Scala, right? So doing all that typecasting, doing the, the, when I did this presentation, some of the teams were much farther along. They told me that I can do it in a much better way in Scala. So the typecasting is just a representation of my, <laughs> my experiments with Scala, right? My concern was that it was an attribute of the, the no, not the at all. Framework you were not at all. Not at all. You can you can get you can do it with cases much better. I think. Okay. Thank you so much.